I think that's true, and I think that there are um, a lot of good guys in, in the police forces, and there are a lot of good people who work for the government. In fact, when we actually really start to make uh, pr progress against this whole regime, we'll see a lot of people in the government joining us. This is, this is what's happened in any other similar instance in, in human history. The rulers can no longer count on their own troops or their own police. We saw a little bit of this back during the Vietnam War. I've always argued that the reason that they couldn't keep up the Vietnam War, which was a war of aggression against innocent people, entirely evil, entirely rotten, um, probably there were six million people killed. Um, uh, Martin Van Creville, the great Israeli military historian, um, has said the U.S. was responsible for the death of six million people in uh, Laos, in South Vietnam, in North Vietnam, and in Cambodia. Of course, no American, those names are not on a wall anyplace in Washington. Nobody cares about that sort of thing. But at some point, the American troops started to mutiny. They started to refuse their orders. They started to have sit-down strikes. And I think that when that started happening, it scared the pants off the people in Washington, the striped pants. And they had to start getting the troops out. They had to end the war. And something even similar happened that after World War I when Winston Churchill, the evil Winston Churchill, wanted to take over all of the Ottoman Empire, make it part of the British Empire, and conquer it, and make them actual colonies of Britain. And he writes about this in his private letters. He it says it's so horrible that the British troops had had enough of war. They wanted to go home. They weren't going to fight anymore. They weren't going to go conquer um, uh, what was, has since become Iraq and Syria and Lebanon and so forth. So that is actually what's going to happen. Um, this is what they fear most when their own troops, their own soldiers, even their own spies are going to put the people first instead of the government first. We're going to go to break. Long segment coming up, uh, Lou. But when we come back, I want to get your take on what you were already alluding to. In fact, I did an audio blog a few days ago on this specific issue that the system, whenever we're ready to stand up and fight back, they always retreat. But then when we get comfortable again, they always reemerge. We've seen that with the TSA. They backed off uh, not just on Thanksgiving Day, but have backed off in, in uh, many respects since then. And as you said, they're now trying to come back a month later to start uh, enforcing it. They don't want us to ever gain critical mass. And, and they don't ever want us to learn that we can have political victories, just like you mentioned with the troops uh, in uh, Vietnam. Stay there. Resistance to tyrants is obedience to God. It's Alex Jones. It's 34 after. Thank you for joining us. It's the next to last live transmission of 2010 as we hurdle the 2011 and beyond. Lou Rockwell of LouRockwell.com is our guest. Our websites, of course, are InfoWars.com and PrisonPlanet.tv. Uh, Lou, going back to the point that I was uh, starting to make before the break, I mean, I guess to simply quantify it, they don't ever want us to have a chance to fight them out in the open peacefully and show the power of the people, show that we have common sense and the majority and the republic on our side and we see them back off and I have read the histories as, a, as a, uh, uh, you covered and, and can concur that it was finally when the troops started saying no they didn't want uh, that message to be sent that the ruling powers had lost control they wanted to then shift and behave like they had decided uh, to end the war that was just a black hole uh, for drug dealing and uh, their no-bid contracts uh, and more and more, uh, I see the establishment not having just that psychopathic gleam of the priest of power, but more and more, I am seeing desperate fear. Uh, can you elaborate on your statement, but then also get into uh, what you think the state of this, of this corrupt global government is and how you see liberty versus tyranny colliding in the future? You know, Alex, there's no question that they're terrified. And I, I always get a kick out of it when there's some little Cessna that flies by mistake over Capitol Hill. And all of a sudden, they're all running around like chickens with their heads cut off and going crazy. Just recently, they they, they shut down the Pentagon uh, stop on the metro, the the, the uh, D.C. area subway system, because somebody had a, had a flashing uh, Christmas uh, ornament. And so they, you know, shut down the subway, shut, you know, and they're all terrified and... Uh, on the metro, for example, they have a 
friend who just told me they have groups of five uh, armored troops, or maybe they're armored police, I don't know, with automatic weapons uh, patrolling around. Well, this, of course, is to, is to go after us, not terrorists, and to terrorize us, to make us afraid. But it's also because the government is afraid. I think, I think the government has been afraid for, uh, maybe they've always been afraid. Maybe they, maybe they always have realized that they're just like a bunch of fleas um, on a dog, and they're always afraid we're going to scratch them off. And we can scratch them off, and they are constantly terrified. Of course, that can mean that they're even more brutal than normal because they're terrified. But they can't actually, if the, if the people refuse to go along, they can't actually do anything to us. So, uh, and we only need peaceful resistance. Uh, after all, the, the tools of violence, of murder, of uh, uh, all the weapons and the bombs and that sort of thing, those are the tools of government. They're not the, tr- the tools of a, of, uh, of a peaceful resistance. We don't need that stuff. I believe that we can do it just by telling them no, by withholding our consent. Um, you know, I take a, I take the rad, very radical position. For example, I don't I don't vote. I don't I don't. If somebody enjoys voting, well, go right ahead. But I would argue that it's actually a, a negative to vote um, because it's the sacrament of the state, the sacrament of the democratic religion that you're supposed to partake in this. Um, they want you to be focused on them, focused on the politicians, love the politicians, um, be cheering for, you know, gangster A's versus gangster B's. Well, that's what all the telescreens now in 9,000 locations, first it was 800 Walmarts, now 9,000 stores, to have huge telescreens where they force their way into your life in the market, where they force their way into your life in the school telling kids that men with, uh, you know, turbans are under the table about to climb out and hurt them. I mean, it literally is a religion of them being front and center and playing the part uh, of our God, but then meanwhile they act so afraid of the public, we get their internal training manuals that law enforcement leaked to us and others, and they're totally afraid of Ron Paul, of Bob Barr, of libertarians, of gun owners, of returning veterans, all tyrants. Hitler was afraid of the military. I mean, this is classic tyranny, and I'm reminded of Proverbs 28.1. The wicked flee when no man pursueth them. They act guilty. They're not just guilty on the intellectual evidence. They act like crooks. Well, they know they're crooks. And uh, I remember the great Lysander Spooner, the 19th century American anarchist, who said, the difference, what's the difference between a congressman and a highwayman? And he said, the difference is the highwayman doesn't ask you to call him the honorable. <laughs> right, so that's, I mean, these, these people, you know, as Murray Rothbard said, government is the gang of thieves writ large. It <laughs> acts like a gang of thieves. It has the morals of a gang of thieves. And just like a regular gang of thieves, they're terrified that the victims uh, might organize against them. And that's it. And our forefathers weren't perfect, but you notice how much time the media and education spends demonizing them. It's because I've studied a wide spectrum of history. There's never been a more truly educated group of people. Uh, never a more a flower of renaissance and awakening and, 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 I mean, literally trying to read their letters. They weren't showing off with complex words and prose. These were people who, 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 who it, it, was, it was honored to be an inventor or a trailblazer or a scientist uh, or, or an inventor. And so because that was what the competition was about, it accelerated uh, an amazing, again, a flower of of the Renaissance and is the greatest example of anything that we've developed so far, and that's why they're trying to pull it down and destroy it. Well, you'll notice in schools, of course, children are no longer taught about great businessmen, great inventors, uh, other great figures in the private sector. They're only taught about alleged great people in the government, and you're, you're right that we're supposed to forget anybody in the 18th century or before. In fact, the current American regime was founded by Abraham Lincoln. Uh, you only have to, I, I urge anybody, if you have the unfortunate um, uh, duty of having to go to Washington, D.C., make sure you go look at the Lincoln Temple. This was built in the progressive era, a, a time of vastly increasing government like our own. And uh, this thing is, is, is modeled after the Temple of Jupiter, best and greatest in ancient Rome, the chief god of the Roman state. Abraham Lincoln is in his throne. He's got fasces, fasces uh, uh, on either side of, the, of his throne. And uh, this is not, this is this is a god. So 
Yeah, the government always is in competition with God. The government would like to beat God. I think they looked to the days of the Pharaoh, and that was the best time when the government actually was God. Well, that's why their symbol the in the New World Order is the pyramid. And for those that don't know what fasci are, in Rome, their main symbol and what their armies carried and what was carved on their temples and government buildings is a bundle of sticks tied together with hatchets on the top, meaning we enslave you, we bind you, and force or what Mao said, you know, political power goes out of the barrel of a gun, you know, force uh, impels you to serve us. And you're right, uh, they brought into the Senate, what, in the last 80 years or so, uh, and, and, and suddenly everywhere, fasci, it's on our money. I mean, they're telling you what they are. Well, it's true, and of course, this is what the fascist party and the system of fascism is therefore uh, named after. And by the way, fascism and fascist is not just an epithet. This is an actual political philosophy, it's an economic philosophy, and it is the current regime in America. It may be a form of so far soft fascism, but this government, big business, big government partnership against the people, that is fascism. And that is, of course, the way the government runs, the huge corporate interests. Uh, in league with a huge government uh, to rip off the American people and rip off, in fact, the people of the whole world through the Federal Reserve and all the, the World Bank and the U.N. and all the rest of the things the U.S. government and uh, its uh, the power elite set up. So this is uh, fascism is a very real thing. I, I myself, I, I don't ever, I never thought communism, even though communism was, you know, maybe the worst thing ever to exist in terms of uh, the way countries were run. Uh, but it was never, I don't think there was ever any, any, any danger of Americans becoming communists. But I must say, after Federal Failure Day on 9-11-1, uh, when I saw the reaction of Americans, and since then I thought, you know, now I understand how Hitler came to power. Now I understand how people you thought of as decent, great people in Germany could overnight all of a sudden be cheering for a police state and for all kinds of other, you know, and, and, and demonizing it. Well, that's what's scary is so I've forth. studied Weimar Germany and the people, low crime rates, very moral by our standards, very hardworking, and they bought the Kool-Aid because they'd been in a depression, they were scared, that they, they'd been demoralized, and they just, and by the way, 20 million Germans died in that war, folks, so, I mean, look at what it cost them buying into that big government fraud. Well, it's true, and if you know, and a key thing is, that, as you pointed out, it was the Weimar Depression and the Weimar inflation, uh, which was forced on Germany. Even John Maynard Keynes said wrongly. Uh, after all, there were other people responsible for starting World War One. It wasn't just Germany, Russia, France. And the Britain too, but they didn't have any reparations put on them. It had a horrific. Effect. Well, they were on record upset at Germany's rise. The British Empire couldn't compete with them. No, they. That's of course this was all about. That's what the war was about, and uh, so they crushed. It's always evil. Saint Augustine talked about this. It's an evil thing in a war, as bad as war is. One of the worst things in war is to seek to totally crush the opposition, grind them into the ground, destroy their society, destroy everything about them. It's it brings just hate and more evil. And, of course, we had uh, the second installment of World War I and just a few years later, World War II. But uh, the Germans went through this hyperinflation, which has tremendous, not only bad, tremendous economic effects, but tremendously bad cultural and moral effects on a people. It destroys people's belief in anything permanent. And it had a very, very bad effect on the Germans. And in fact, that's something we face today in this country. We face the possibility, certainly of a 1970s-style inflation, maybe something much worse. We can know for sure because things depend on uh, the subjective opinions of the, of the people. It's not just what the government does. The government's printing the money. It depends on what our view is of what's happening. Yeah, overall confidence, but the indicators are the debt ratios are astronomically bigger, as you know, as the head of the Von Mies Institute, compared to what they were in the 70s. And people know real unemployment is 22 percent. They know it's not 9.8. And that was my next question for you. Uh, Ron Paul has stated this. Dr. Paul, you've stated it. People have really studied history and, 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 and finance. The great danger is, and I want you to elaborate, Lou Rockwell, uh, here with us today, is that during this crisis period, they may actually use it to bring in the more hardcore fascism, and that might come out of the Republican Party or something, as the solution. Uh, and uh, so instead of using total government slash fascist failure as a way to get our republic back and more freedom, it may go the other direction into just hardcore hyper-tyranny. 
Well, we're in a crisis. We're facing a greater crisis. And in a crisis, this is when radical change can happen. But, of course, it can be radically bad as well as, as, well as radically good.